one of the major components that property managers will deal with, one of the biggest heartaches is the risk heartache. And I know several property managers that have told me that this is where the second most problems come from. Their maintenance is number one, and I told you that. Risk is number two. Well, there are several ways to handle risk. The first way is completely avoid the risk. It is very hard to drown in the apartment pool if there is no pool there, right? You get what I'm saying? If there is no a pool in the apartment complex, you have completely avoided the risk of drowning potential and a lawsuit because you avoided the risk by removing the factor. The second one, and this is usually the easiest one that most people go to or most property managers go to, is the controlling of that risk. There are things you can do. I am sure that you probably have seen, if not own, one of those cards that allows you to, you know, you pass the card in front of the sensor and it goes boop and unlocks the door for you. And only people with those cards, that is a method of controlling the risk because they are only allowing certain people in that door. If there is a automatic fire suppression system over a commercial stove and you if you've ever cooked in a commercial kitchen there's a fire suppression system right there that is required under the building code that we have talked about or will talk about and that is a method of control so that is typically the best way avoiding it you kind of say well dude yeah i know it'd be kind of cool to swim on this 90 degree day but we don't have a pool so a lot of people will use a method to control it. And one of the ways to control that pool might be your room key card that unlocks your door to your room, also unlocks the pool so that nobody else that doesn't live there can get in. That would be a method of control. The next two, which have spilled onto the next page, are actually inverse of each other, okay? You can keep the risk, you can keep the risk, or you can transfer the risk. So let's talk about this. Wouldn't it be really cool if I could pay someone to take the risk for me? Well, we have those. It is called insurance, right? And if you think of your insurance and you say, well, I have got this deductible. In essence, that is the amount of risk that you kept. And I am going to transfer this amount to the insurance company. That is going to cost you a premium to transfer this amount of risk, whatever this amount is. And we all are aware that we say, you know what? If I want to raise my deductible to here, now here is my deductible. And I now have transferred less risk. Therefore, what happens to my premium? It goes down. And the trade-off is, now instead of paying the first $5,000 deductible, this one may be $7,500 deductible. But my monthly payment here is 100, and here it might have been 150. That is how this insurance works. You determine how much you want to keep versus how much you want to transfer to the insurance company. 
and you can jockey back and forth between those to generate a different premium per month. The less you transfer, the less your premium is. And there are several different types of insurance that are out there. I'll come back to number one. There is a fire and hazard insurance. Guess what this covers? It covers fires and hazards. They're kind of tricky on how they name these things. So think of this insurance as the insurance on the structure. That is the insurance on the structure of the building. And it would guard against all these civil unrests, uh, windstorms, all of that. The second type of insurance I want to talk about is this thing called consequential loss. You will hear this called business loss insurance. So if the building that my bar was in burnt to the ground, the fire and hazard insurance might cover the structure to get rebuilt. But the time that that property is being rebuilt, I cannot sell drinks. So I've actually lost business income. This insurance right here would cover the loss of the income that was going on inside of that structure. So think of the first one as the insurance on the structure. The second one, this consequential loss, is the insurance on the business inside of that structure. And then the third one that usually goes together is the liability, which is the insurance for the people doing the business inside of the structure. It could also cover the public that's in there. A very special type of this would be the insurance that would cover your employees that are working. That would be workers' comp insurance. So what you have that I have skipped around on this list are three types. You've got the fire and hazard, which is the structure. You've got the consequential loss, which is the business inside of the structure. Then you've got the liability insurance, which is the people doing the business inside of the structure. Those three things typically get bought as an insurance policy together. And any time that you have multiple insurance types, they call this a multi-parallel policy. Multi-parallel, meaning there's three different types of insurance, all right? There are some other insurance called contents and personal property. You will see this as most people like to call this, back here to this one, renter's insurance, right? Because a renter's insurance covers that contents and personal property. Hey, the fire and hazard policy will cover the apartment building, but if your TV gets melted because it's in my building, my policy doesn't cover that, Mr. Tenant. You better have contents and personal property. This is also the same insurance that someone who owns a condo might get because the condo association has bought the fire and hazard for the structure, all right? You pay into the condo association and they use that money to buy the policy to cover the structure, but you may still need, oops, wrong one. You may still need contents and personal property to cover that. All right. There is this thing called a surety bond and a surety bond. All of these other insurances that I've mentioned are like stationary, meaning if you come into my classroom for a live class, I have liability insurance 
so that if you fell and hurt yourself, my liability insurance would cover you. You walk out of my building, my insurance doesn't cover you anymore because it's stationary. There is this thing called a surety bond, which think of it like a traveling insurance. It covers my employees doing something negligent or a criminal act. Think of the maintenance men in a property or in an apartment complex. So, you know, unit 106 calls down and says, my toilet stopped up. Can you send up a maintenance man? Yes, that maintenance man is going to be covered under a surety bond that travels with him. So that if he goes into unit 106 and let's say he trips and falls and puts a hole in your TV and destroys it, his insurance that traveled into your apartment with him would cover that. All right, that's the surety bond concept. Talked about that multi peril policy. Now, we have touched on this before about the different types where there is an insurance policy that will actually pay to replace that TV completely. That would be replacement cost. And then there is an insurance policy that will pay what the actual cash policy is now on that TV because it takes in depreciation. Hey, that TV was two years old. It's not worth 500 now. The actual cash value is 300. Here's your $300. And I asked you at that time, what? Well, if we've got one that pays a replacement, why would we want one that has a depreciated cash value? Because of the cost of the premium. Back to this concept right here. Back to this concept. You've got this one. Premiums more than that one. Same thing. A replacement policy may be more than the actual cash value. That's why you would have one is so that you're paying a lower monthly premium. So that's the appraisals. Or no, it's not. <laughs> that's the property management section. You can guarantee that there's going to be some math questions that deal with leasing commissions, that deal with rental rates. So you can count on that. Uh, I know that there's some questions that deal with the different types of maintenance. You know, you got pre preventative, you've got corrective, you've got routine, all of those things. Keep in mind those three things that a property manager is supposed to be cognizant of. Achieving the objectives, generating income, and preserving the property. And which one's the most important? Preserving the property. Once again, we've got questions right down here. There are questions in the back of the book. If you have other questions or just want to talk about real estate, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com and I'll check you out on the next chapter. Have a good day.